Good morning. Welcome to today's forum with our special guest, Dr. Melissa Wei Tsing Inoue. I'm Dr. John Armstrong, a professor of philosophy at Southern Virginia and director of the Honors Program, which is sponsoring this event. Please take a photo of this slide. I'll move quickly. Tonight, there's a 90s themed dance in the Stoddard Center. Tomorrow morning, the YSA Stake is holding a service activity. Tomorrow afternoon, our men's volleyball, lacrosse, and baseball teams have games. Our cheer and dance teams finished as grand champions of their divisions at last Saturday's CCA Collegiate Championship. Next Friday, buses will begin leaving the Institute parking lot at 3 p.m. for the Richmond, Virginia Temple Open House. Contact your ward to reserve a seat. There will be an advising fair that day at 11 a.m. here in the arena. Dr. Inoue will hold a post-forum Q&A for students this afternoon at 3.30 p.m. in Main Hall 205. She'll discuss nurturing an active intellect and a faithful heart the theme of an essay collection that she and the late and beloved Kate Holbrook edited, Every Needful Thing, which was just published by Deseret Book and BYU's Maxwell Institute, and to which one of Southern Virginia's outstanding new faculty members, Professor Ariel Clark Silver, was a contributor. Current students can now register for fall on-campus housing through MySVU or the housing office. It's first come, first serve, so don't wait. It's also time to register for summer and fall courses. Please meet with your academic advisor as soon as possible to discuss your course schedule, career plans, and perhaps your plans for graduate school. Summer term is a great time to take classes here because you focus on only a couple of courses the campus is green, the flowers are blooming, some of your professors will take you outside for class, the tuition is discounted, and a Pell Grant might be available to help cover the cost. See Student Financial Services on the second floor of Main Hall to discuss your options. Some summer courses are online, too, like mine. You are welcome to take honors courses and seminars, even if you haven't joined the honors program. These courses build on Southern Virginia's core. This fall's focus courses are on works by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Martin Luther King Jr., Robert Frost, Zora Neale Hurston, Plato, woo, <laughs> Sophocles, the Persian poet Rumi, and Nate Shaw, an illiterate sharecropper who became a political activist for black and poor farmers' interests in the South in the early 20th century. Another is an introduction to reading the Gospel of John in Greek. Two interdisciplinary honors seminars are also available, one on happiness, another on minds, brains, and neuroscience. I'm grateful to my talented colleagues for teaching honors courses, including Professors Richard Gardner, Sam Hurt, and Laura Knight for supervising six honors theses in biology and history this semester. For full descriptions of this fall's honors courses, go to svu.edu slash honors. We will begin with an opening prayer by Sasha Willey, a biochemistry major and honors student from Utah. She was recently called to serve as a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ and assigned to the Baltic states to preach the gospel in Lithuanian. Bella Voce will then sing Dan Forrest's arrangement of I Know That My Redeemer Lives. After Bella Voce, Dr. Silver, an assistant professor of English, will introduce Dr. Inoue. We will then hear from our special guest. After Sister Inoue's remarks, the audience will have a few minutes to ask her questions. Addie Thorpe, a music major from Colorado, will then lead us in singing Love One Another, and Lily Calderwood, an English major and honor student from Virginia who's been called to serve as a missionary and assigned to Taiwan to preach the gospel in Mandarin, will be saying the closing prayer. Sasha. Dear Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for this campus and this university, and we're especially grateful for Melissa Inouye's safe arrival here on campus and the opportunity that we get to hear from her. 
please bless her and bless us that we can take what we what she teaches to us today and apply it in our daily lives. Please bless President Wilcox in his recovery and bless his family that they may feel thy comfort. And please bless President Denna as he guides our campus community. We're very grateful for all that he's done for us. Please bless all the missionaries out in the field that they may, may feel thy love and support as they preach and serve the gospel. We love thee and we're grateful for all that thou has done for us. And we're grateful for thy atonement and the opportunity that it gives us to become more like thee. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It is a great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Melissa Inouye, to you today. We are so delighted to have her here with us and anticipate the rich insights and spirit she will bring to this gathering. Dr. Inouye was born and raised in Southern California and is a fourth-generation Chinese-Japanese-American. Melissa served a mission in Taiwan, and in 2003, she graduated magna cum laude in East Asian Studies from Harvard College. In 2011, she received her PhD in East Asian Languages and Civilizations from Harvard University. Melissa is a historian of modern China and global Christianity. In 2019, she published a monograph, China and the True Jesus, Charisma and Organization in a Chinese Christian Church with Oxford University Press, and a memoir, Crossings, with the Maxwell Institute. She has just edited a new collection, Every Needful Thing, which brings together the experience of LDS female academics and professionals across the globe. She currently works as a historian at the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and leads the Global Mormon Studies Initiative. She also enjoys running and drawing. As Melissa met with faculty members yesterday, she described being on the edge of multiple intersecting worlds. 
which places her at a center point from which she can interact with many realms. She describes this position as one of crossings, the title of her memoir, but likes to emphasize that these interstices have come to her or are contained within her. This multivalence allows her to bring ideas which may feel disparate or even contradictory into conversation. But Melissa is not just at the perimeter of several different spheres as they connect with each other. She is contemplatively making her way around the circumference of each one of them, carefully surveying what each contains, and then considering deeply how these domains might speak to each other. She exclaims that this marginality is the purpose of God's plan of salvation. We are all aliens, exiles, sojourners, far from our spiritual home. The purpose of life is to come to terms with the depth of this alienation in ourselves and in others, and to respond with charity, to seek, receive, and share the pure love of Christ so that we may be one amidst our differences. Melissa has become a joyful, clear-eyed, honest, and penetrating voice of devotion in its deepest and most universal sense, claiming for us all the common heritage we share as children of a loving God who wants us to be reconciled to one another and to our Creator. Let's give Melissa a very warm Southern Virginia welcome. Thanks so much, Bella Voce, for that song. That was incredible. I wish that was a song that we sang in the hymn book um, for that title. Uh, and thanks for that very kind and generous introduction. So um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm just totally blown away by the awesome campus. I wish I had classrooms with sinks in them. That would be so handy. That would be really great. So just um, a word about myself, uh, just by way of introduction. I, in my former life, I was a professor of Chinese history at the University of Auckland. And, and actually, this is a very significant picture for me because um, on the right-hand side, there's my husband, Joseph, and I, um, in this beautiful kind of vista at, um, I believe that's maybe Kerry Kerry. No, it's yeah, one of the beaches in New Zealand. And um, we looked really happy. And this was like the two weeks before my life-changing cancer diagnosis that kind of changed my life, derailed my academic career, and landed me in Draper, Utah, where I currently am, um, working as a historian for the church history department. Um, and that itself has been a strange and wonderful transformation, and it's, it's really great to be um, where I am now as well. So life has so many surprises. So um, some of the things that I enjoy doing, this is the pond in front of my house. Um, so... I really dislike invasive species, and as a cancer patient, it feels particularly personal, like when there's like this one thing that grows and grows and grows and takes over everything else and all the other living things. So um, one of my kind of current hobbies is um, anti-Phragmite, anti-Russian olive removal. I believe you actually have Phragmites in uh, Virginia and, and also Maryland as well, I think. Mm, maybe you don't, because... Um, <laughs> I, I've seen them somewhere, maybe in Maryland, but if you see Phragmites, kill them on the spot. Um, so, and on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of um, like a, a kind of stake cleanup, uh, frag, anti-Phragmites activity that we had. So um, we're going to be talking about how useful um, it is to be part of larger communities for when you see something you need to get done, you just enlist the help of your community and things get done. So I'd like to start with reading a section of scripture from the book of Moses, which, as you know, Joseph Smith was um, translating through a kind of revelatory process in December 1830. It says, and, it, uh, and just to kind of back up a little bit, you know, this is the story, a kind of massive expansion on the story of Enoch, uh, who, who appears very briefly in the King James Version of the Bible, for instance, but then um, Joseph Smith's translation uh, expands on this and kind of um, gives us this really rich, fascinating, and I think meaningful new perspectives on Enoch. So um, Enoch is talking to God, and God is kind of giving Enoch this amazing, I don't know if it's out-of-body experience, but it's clearly some kind of super 
lens, goggles, something. He's, he's able to see things that normal people just don't see. He sees everything. He sees all the worlds that were created. He sees all the humans and the people that were created. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Enoch and told Enoch all the doings of the children of men. Wherefore Enoch knew and looked upon their wickedness and their misery and wept and stretched forth his arms and his heart swelled wide as eternity and his bowels yearned and all eternity shook. And it came to pass that Enoch looked upon the earth and he heard a voice from the bowels of the earth, bowels thereof saying, Woe, woe is me, the mother of humankind. I am pained, I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. When shall I rest and be cleansed from the filthiness which has gone forth out of me? When will my creator sanctify me that I may rest in righteousness for a season? Abide upon my face. And when Enoch heard the earth mourn, he wept and cried unto God, saying, O Lord, wilt thou not have compassion upon the earth? Wilt thou not bless the children of Noah? And... um, this uh, you know, it's a very emotional scene. Um, it's very interesting. Like Enoch is interacting with eternity. Eternity is interacting with Enoch. Um, so many things to talk about that we can't talk about. I just want to note some things. In the subsequent passages, uh, Enoch repeatedly says, um, when shall the earth rest? He says, will it be when Jesus comes? Uh, but then he sees Jesus has come. And then even after that, he sees that we still have these problems. And he says, when shall the earth rest? So this passage, um, to me, captures the poignancy, the burden of, of living in a world of agency and also a world of natural laws um, in which we interact with each other. We are subject to each other's agency, each other's really stupid decisions, as well as each other's kindnesses, in which the earth is subject to our really stupid decisions as well as to our, our loving care. Uh, and actually, another question that comes up when we think about Enoch's question, when will the earth rest, the kind of question behind it is, why don't you fix this? God, all-powerful creator, you know, why, how do, how do you allow such harm? How do you allow people to bear these unfair burdens? How do you allow, you know, people to, to, to destroy uh, the things that are beautiful that you've created? That's, I think, the big question, which also is like a really huge question. People write all about theodicy, so we won't get into that today um, that much. Uh, but, but there's two kind of major um, things that I think we can think about as Latter-day Saints and as people of faith um, and goodwill everywhere, which is how can we have compassion on the earth and how can we bless the lives of others of God's children, the, the people around us? So I'd like to... Um, Take it one tiny shot at that first question, uh, why doesn't God fix us, from the story of Emily Bates. And, and throughout my talk today, I'm going to be quoting from the scholars in Every Needful Thing uh, because their perspectives are so um, prescient and so uh, relevant, I think, to, to these questions of how do we um, deal with the big problems that we face as human beings and as inhabitants of the planet. So Emily Bates, um, you can see here uh, in this picture, she's a blonde lady under R, and around her are the people who work with her in her lab, her PhD students. So Emily is a brilliant scientist, um, but she grew up um, with dyslexia and also um, getting constant migraines that would make her miss school, uh, make it hard for her to do homework. So she fighting against these two you know, pretty significant um, challenges. She uh, got into Harvard Medical School uh, after serving a mission in Switzerland and uh, became an expert in genetics. Um, I think she she studies how ion channels uh, work um, and how they interact with various drugs. So um, Emily Bates has some thoughts on why God doesn't fix us. Like, why do we have to muddle through these horrible experiences by ourselves? And why do we have such difficulty in our lives? She says, learning is most exciting and enduring when students are led to their own discoveries. A good teacher facilitates discovery by providing students with opportunities to learn concepts for themselves. I believe our father and mother in heaven are master teachers. They want us to learn through our own experience because the lessons we learn in this way will help us remember what we have learned and how to use it. She says, as a child, she wondered, you know, why doesn't God fix me? Like, I believe that God has the power to take away my pain. Um, The migraines that, you know, make me vomit, make me lose my vision, um, confine me to my bed, you know, for days. God can take that away. Um, 
and now she says that she studied science and she studies how the body works. And now she's actively working to figure out how to heal bodies that have gone awry. She says, as my view of God shifted to that of master teachers, I began to believe that our heavenly parents expect us to learn from our own earthly struggles and to learn to care for our sisters and brothers during theirs. I think our heavenly parents expect us to do our best to make life better for each other. So it's up to us. Um, God could swoop in and fix everything, but for very, very wise reasons, our heavenly parents have put us here, uh, subject to each other's agencies, subject to the elements of nature, um, able to be influenced by hurricanes and earthquakes, and also able to, um, you know, pollute rivers and chop down forests. Now, there are some more questions here which we actually can't talk about, but I want to just ask them so that they're percolating in your heads. Um, are these questions of like compassion on the earth and compassion on others? Are they different questions? Are they the same questions? Are they are they fundamentally separate or are they similar or are the same? Um, what does the earth mean when she says that she is a mother of humankind? Are we talking about you know, carbon atoms or are we talking about something else? Um, and this last question, which I do want us to talk about here, is what can one person do to solve the problems humanity faces? What can one person do? Not that much. It's a big world out there. Um, so I'm a historian of Chinese history. Just to live um, in Chinese history, uh, there's this very common understanding that you have to work together with a lot of people. So the process of farming rice, the staple grain in China, um, is extremely time intensive and you need a lot of manual labor. So you've got to, um, you've got to fill in all the cracks in the field. You've got to level the field so that it's going to have an even layer of water on it. You've got to till the field once the water is in, a little bit of water is in the field to, to level the hard pan. You've got to uh, grow the rice from seedlings and keep them in a place, and then when they're ready, when they've got three or four leaves on the plants, then you take them out into the wet field and you transplant them, you know, one by one, bending down. Um, you've got to harvest the rice, you've got to sieve the rice, husks, and um, if you're not out there working, then you're inside weaving fabric or spinning thread so that you can sell it, which will give you a little extra money, which might keep you alive during the winter because um, you can buy new things. And, and also the grandmother um, um, is tending the children so that the women can work. So in order just to survive in Chinese history, you had to do a lot of work, and critically, you had to do it with a lot of people. They're, everyone was kind of dividing the labor to to get things done. And that's how you get things like this done, um, which are rice terraces in the mountainous region of Yunnan province. I mean, think about the work that it took um, from a lot of people just to survive um, there. So as a Latter-day Saint, um, this is probably the thing that I love the most about my church, which is that it connects me to a lot of people. And and in my life, um, whenever I've wanted to get something done, I've always turned to my Latter-day Saint brothers and sisters. So, for example, we've been through this horrible pandemic. Um, in 2020, um, I'm married to a teacher, and you know, I was seeing firsthand how difficult it was for, for students in this kind of switch to online learning. And so I wanted to do something that would help the teachers, help the students, but I just, you know, I thought, I'm just one little person. What can I do? Um, but... Uh, through various connections, like my home teachy, or we, what do we call them now, my ministering sister, and um, you know, people in my ward, uh, people that I know through Letter Saint Networks, we were able to um, raise a lot of money um, to uh, launch a kind of emergency COVID response and education nonprofit um, that gave money to teachers and um and, and was able to do something way more than what I could have done as as a person. And this is this has happened throughout my whole life. Any time I've ever wanted to do something, um, I've always turned to to the Latter Day Saints, and and that's um, what I think is one of the best things about the church. So, um, so the basic idea is, I think our, the world's burdens are heavy, and and to move to shift these burdens to do something with them, we need a lot of people. And I know that organized religion nowadays is like not very popular. It feels like almost like a dirty word, organized religion. Um, but I just like to suggest that um, 
that organized religion is probably one of the best things about religion and probably one of the things that the world today really needs. And when we think about the problems that we face, these huge, complex, global problems like you know, climate change, um, like the, th- the threat of war, um, what we need are big networks that connect a lot of people across a lot of different boundaries and barriers. And that's exactly what the church does. Um, it's one of the best, the best systems that I know. Um, for doing this kind of thing. So I'd like to encourage us to organize with your religion and save the world. So these two things, how can we have compassion on the earth? How can we bless the lives of others? Um, I'd like to turn to some perspectives from the biologists in Every Needful Thing. Um, Kira Krakos is a botanist. She studies uh, plant-pollinator interactions. And she says, um, understanding pollination is important to human survival. Over 85% of wild flowering plants depend to some extent on pollination. Honeybees alone pollinate about 66% of the world's 1,500 crop species, accounting for 15 to 30% of food production. Like many complex systems, pollination can lose many of the interacting flowers and pollinators of the network to to extinction or climate change, but hold together because of the redundancies built into the system. However, shake the network too long and hard and it will collapse. The pollination web is intricate, in peril, and in need of our care, understanding, and active preservation. I'm really grateful for the comments that um, presiding bishop, Bishop Kause, uh, made in the last Latter-day Saint General Conference where he called on us to be good stewards of the earth. To, um, to take steps to protect the Earth's resources. And, um, and Kira's knowledge of these systems helps us to see how intricate, how fragile they are, and how beautiful. Um, so I, I, mentioned, I alluded to this question, you know, when the Earth talks about the filthiness that's on, on her and, and says, you know, we, we t- I think we tend to think about moral filthiness because that's, the context of how we usually read that. But I think we could also talk about actual filthiness, you know, like pollution, um, the the pollution we put into the air, the pollution that we put into the waters, um, the ways in which we're not careful with these um, delicate and beautiful systems that God has given us. They're all gifts. Our agency is a gift. Our physical um, well-being is a gift. And that depends on the gifts of the earth, the air, the food, the water. Um, Dr. Julie Barrett Willis, who's a geologist at Brigham Young University, Idaho, um, talks about the sacred significance of things like rocks. She says, I cannot look like at, a, at a mountain, a glacier, or even a pebble without thinking about its origin and the processes that shaped it. These thoughts lead to awe for the natural processes at work, for our creator, and for the scientists who came before me. And then she talks about um, this... this um, continuum between revelatory methods and scientific methods. In her mind, there's no separation between um, like secular knowledge and spiritual knowledge. She says, revelatory methods and scientific methods are both valid tools, useful within their own spheres for seeking knowledge. They both follow a pattern of asking questions, seeking answers, interpreting information, and sharing newfound knowledge. The key to gaining any new knowledge is to actively ask questions and seek answers. So the Latter-day Saint tradition has blessed us with a theology that embraces study of all things. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, Joseph Smith receives a revelation about how he's to organize, um, every, prepare every needful thing, and also to, to study all sorts of different kinds of fields of endeavor, from politics to science to history, um, and, and so on. So we're really blessed with this um, This theology is a blessing because it helps us to harmonize um, the work that that we believe will help us be like God and the work in front of us that needs to be done, including the trees in front of us, the mountains in front of us. Here at Southern Virginia U- University, you have this incredible natural setting. I can't believe how beautiful it is. I just keep on looking out the windows, and um, it's just incredible. Um, you know, that beauty is a gift of the Creator, and that beauty is directly necessary for our life. It's not a perk. It is itself um, the vital substance that allows us to breathe, drink, and eat. So I hope that we can uh, listen to Bishop Kausay's uh, counsel and find ways that we can care for the earth so that the earth can rest. The Enoch's second question was, how can we bless the lives of others of God's children? He says, Lord, 
uh, when will thou bless the children of Noah? And um, this is not just up to the Lord. This is also up to us. So I'd like to share a couple of things, um, examples, again, from outstanding Latter-day Saints scholars who are blessing the lives of others, and maybe we can um, derive some inspiration from them or get some ideas on what we can do. One great blessing that is brought by organized religion, any, any sort of organized religion, is shared moral values. When you have um, other people who believe as you do, you have a little more strength in standing up to people who want you to deviate from those values. And here we have this great example of Isoha Ikpornwen, the chief justice of Edo State in Nigeria from 2017 to 2019. She's probably the highest ranking um, like Latter-day Saint legal uh, official, I think, that we have. Maybe up there with Christine Durham, who is in charge of Utah's Supreme Court, but Utah's much smaller than Edo State, so I still think she's the number one um, legal official we've got. Um, she says, um, describing one of these cases, in the case of Ozawa Obaza, Osara Obaza versus Governor Edo State, um, I ruled against my state government that illegally moved a local government chairman from office. That was not difficult because it was the right thing to do. There were good and bad repercussions. I was perceived as anti-government and was posted out of the station, but this added to my reputation of being incorruptible, fearless, and a judge that stood for truth and righteousness. I'm so proud to be a member of the church um, that um, Justice Iqpunwin is a member of. Um, when she was uh, being uh, confirmed as a judge, she quoted King Benjamin in her speech, saying, when you're in the service of your fellow beings, you're only in the service of your God. Um, so I'm, the thing that I value so much about being connected to an organized network of people who believe um, in the same values that I do is that it connects me to people whose experiences are different from mine, but also is the same. Um, we also benefit um, as Latter-day Saints and as people of faith in all religions um, from a shared theology or a worldview. When you have um, theological ideas can be powerful because they shape how you see yourself and they shape how you see the purpose of life. So here we have Astrid Tuminez, um, the president currently of Utah Valley University. She says, I was educated by Catholic nuns. When I was five years old, sisters from the Daughters of Charity found me and my family in our hut in the slums of Iloilo City, Philippines. After talking to my mother and other older siblings and deciding that we had some talent, the nuns offered us places for free at their expensive convent school. We said yes. Draped in long white habits and with their waists encircled by long rosaries that dangled down the front and heads adorned with imperfectly pressed wimples, the nuns were God's angels and authority figures, scolding me, molding me, and teaching me to read, write, and dissect frogs. So here, because of another religious organization, the Catholic Church, um, that had this extensive network of education systems and outreach throughout the world, um, Astrid was able to leave her situation of poverty and gain an education and become, you know, uh, a scholar and executive from Microsoft and now the president of UVU University. When she was 10, she converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She says, my new belief actually powered up my desire to excel, to do well in my studies and explore the world and all that it had to offer. I believe sincerely that my mortal life was about preparing to become like God. Progression was endless. I wanted to be knowledgeable and accomplished and also kind and good. Um, she did, I won't read this quote because um, I see that we're running out of time, um, but she did a lot of work in villages um, brokering peace deals between uh, Philippine Muslims, known as the Moro, and the Philippine government. So another way that uh, religious organizations can help is by um, getting people on the same page on important issues. So for example, um, in October 2020, President Russell M. Nelson of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints said, Today I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. Um, there's also a, uh, a press release that came out from the church and the NAACP jointly, um, and especially I'll, I'll point to the second paragraph, which says, We call on government, business, and educational leaders at every level to review... Uh, processes, laws, and organizational attitudes regarding racism and root them out once and for all. So that's quite significant. It's talking not only about racism as a kind of personal moral failing, but also as just a, a fact of organizational um, syste systemic realities. Um, Sharon Eubank, another leader, 
um, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has called on Christ's church to preach deliverance to the captive and his disciples across the world are striving to set at liberty them that are bruised. She says, let me conclude by repeating the question, Jesus and his apostle, Simon Peter, do you love me? The essence of the gospel is contained in that in how we answer that question for ourselves and feed his sheep. Uh, so nearly last of all, I'd like to share um, an example of a Latter-day Saint woman from um, Uganda, um, Olivia Sarabira, and the work that she does. It's really, uh, again, I'm just so proud to be part of the same faith as Olivia Sarabira and, and her colleagues in Uganda. So um, in conclusion... Um, here are some, some takeaways, I think, that we can learn from, from Enoch's questions. Uh, when shall the earth rest? And, and can we bless the children of Noah? And some things that we can learn from the examples of these outstanding Latter-day Saints who are working to, um, to deal with these problems. Work to bless the lives of God's children and the earth that sustains all life. And organize with your religion using your unique gifts and perspectives. Um, one person alone can't do that much. But this doesn't mean that one person's choices aren't really important. The people we connect with, the, the problems we choose to tackle, the causes we choose to join, um, those are all things that only you and I as individuals can decide. Um, remember that you are a producer and a creator of your faith, not just a consumer of it. We're not just customers uh, in a cafeteria doomed to eat whatever's set out with, for us that day. Um, we are the people growing the food, hunting the whatever animals we kill and eat, um, gathering the mushrooms and serving it all up. That's, that's what we do. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not uh, the institution. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are, is the Latter-day Saints. It's you and me. We are the church. And last of all, um, just remember we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If we do this, I believe that we will be able to... Um, not only following the footsteps of Enoch in terms of seeing the problems that we face, but to reach that, um, that conclusion someday, which Enoch and his people reached. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. Thank you. Um, you have such a beautiful light and spirit about you. So thank it's you for the light sharing shining off my head. Today, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit more about your family. Oh, yeah. Uh, so my extended family, um, the Inoues, uh, are all throughout the world, but a lot of them are in Utah. Um, they're descended from my great-grandpa who was an immigrant. And I guess the blessing of being an immigrant family is that your family history is really short because you don't know anything about the pre-immigrant family. So everyone knows the family history because it's like four generations. Um, my kids, I've got uh, four kids um, who have their various teenage struggles right now. I'm sure everyone can remember. Actually, I would really love advice on, on teenage struggles. So please feel free to give advice. Um, and uh, my husband's a math teacher at uh, Hillcrest High School. And he goes to the same high school as my two oldest sons, so he can kind of spy on them. So that's really good. I'm curious, the process you used to find those that participated in your Every Needful Thing, and I'm sure there were many. How did you weed out? How did you select those that participated? That's a great question. I mean, the great irony is, like, we weren't trying to weed anyone out, but we did have a kind of a standard for the book, which was, um, you know, people who have PhDs and, and who are kind of recognized scholars. Um, but, but, you know, because of the nature of um, a lot of things, um, it turns out that this, is, this book was kind of the first collection where these Latter-day Saint women finally felt like they belonged. Like, oh, wow, we're all, you know, scholars and um, many working moms and um, people kind of being gathered together. But then that ends up creating, like, a group of people who maybe then feel excluded, like people who, um, for, for many reasons, you know, chose not to work, chose to stay home with their kids, chose to build their communities in that way. So it was really hard for us because we were trying not to exclude anyone, but um, just the, the the nature of the book was that we tended to focus on people who were scholars, because that's what the Maxwell Institute Living Faith Series is about, scholars talking about their work. 
Um, we had a kind of initial list of people that we knew, but we quickly saw that that would be a huge problem because Kate Holbrook and I are both historians. And if you look at the book, it's already like, there's like four, I think, historians in the book. So it's very historian heavy. And so then we, so we thought, so what are all the other things that we are not that we can include? And so we, we just kind of surveyed all the fields. We tried to get as many scientists as we could, people from the hard sciences. And um, we also just looked at the global church. Um, one of the things that we used for finding people was the church. Um, the, my project at the church history department is the global histories. So if you go to your gospel library app and you go to the church his- history section, within there there's a global history section which has the history of the church everywhere, um, the church exists almost well, we're, there's still a few that are kind of coming out which I'm working on right now but um, most every place has them and so from there we found Isoe Ikponamun for example um, in Nigeria and we also um, through some other connections we found some people um, in Argentina and in Peru so another completely awesome person I could just like go on talking about all the awesome people in the book so one awesome person is um, Ana Maria Gutierrez Valdivia who is currently the lieutenant governor of her state in Peru um, she is an academic person like Asha Tuminez she was raised in, in poverty but um, but just pursued education and and became this really influential academic and um, another cool person is Lisa Sun uh, sorry Lisa Gro, who is the um, the first woman ever and the first person in 15 years to graduate summa cum laude from Harvard Law School. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's really extraordinary people in the book that we are just so happy to find and include. Okay, the church history department and exciting are two words I never thought I would put in the same sentence. <laughs> and yet, really exciting things are coming out of the church history department right now. Would you share some of that? Yeah, absolutely. So the global histories are one of those exciting things. Um, saints... I think, is any, has people heard about saints? It's a multi-volume history of the church. It's really thick books. Uh, but there's an audiobook version. Um, and the, the great thing about saints volume three and four is that's histories that most people don't know. You know, everyone's familiar with, you know, there's like the hand carts going across the plains. Um, but in the third volume of saints, we talk about the early 20th century, which is where there's all these administrative changes happening that actually deliver the kind of modern structure of the church and also involve um, people in Europe and in Mexico. And so that's, like, really exciting that finally um, these stories are now being told. They were always part of the Latter-day Saints story. It's just that people didn't know them. So hopefully those stories are now being told. And um, Saints Volume 4 is, is also really cool. So those are really exciting things. And then another exciting thing that's coming is... Um, we're just doing more regional histories. So instead of like the historians in Salt Lake, like presenting the Swiss with their history, we wrote your history. Um, we're trying to do some like develop in- infrastructure so that in every place, no matter where it is, um, people who really know the history and who are good at that history are the ones writing the history. I know that sounds revolutionary, but yeah, that's this is where we are. I would be interested. What was your aha moment for your testimony? And number two, did your cancer diagnosis shift any of your study of your life focus, of, of, your, of your, your work and your uh, purpose? Second question, absolutely, it shifted my work and focus. Um, I just cared a lot about status. I think in academia, um, you know, we're always kind of like trying to become famous and published. And, you know, and at that point, I just didn't care at all. I just wanted to live um, to raise my kids. Uh, the second, the first question is my aha moment. Well, I, I'm always having aha moments because I'm always having faith crises. So I have many. So yeah, the, the most recent aha moment after my most recent faith crisis was in July. And um, I saw the James Webb telescope images. And I was like, if there's like a God that created that, there's no way I understand that God. Um, that was like the kind of faith crisis part. And then the aha part, I guess, was I just had this really sweet experience where um, I just felt that, that that God like knew me and was aware of me. It was, it was incredible. Yeah. And what kind of perspective might you give all of our students about the broad range of their studies here and how that might grow to help them grow to be the kind of people you're hoping that we will all become? So everything is divine. Everything that we understand. I'm so grateful that I, I didn't become have a career in science, but I'm so grateful for the studies at, in, in university and in, in my chemistry classes that that helped me to kind of appreciate the work that biologists like Kira Krakos and um, Emily Bates do. 
just because, you know, just the intricacies of how life works um, is just so, feels so sacred and awesome. I'm curious to hear more about your time as a lecturer about Asian studies and specifically how your experience in Asian studies has intersected with your testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I guess what, what I love about Asian studies is that it covers most people. Like, for example, um, all of us uh, in, in the world are like, you know, of, of all of us, one-fifth of everyone's Chinese. So if, just by knowing Chinese history, you know the history of one-fifth of everyone, which is really awesome. Um, and it's, it's very humanizing because you, you see how different people have different um, perspectives. And, of course, that's so important to see the humanity in cultures that are different from your own, especially today when we have, you know, war in Russia and Ukraine. We have the threat of war, um, or at least it sounds like it, you know, from, from China or from people who want to go to war with China. And, and I think it's so critical for all of us to understand um, each other so that we don't do that, so we can see each other as individuals and not fall into the trap that nation states fall into when it's one nation state against another nation state. Actually, within each nation state, there's God's children you know, everywhere. So um, I actually wrote a book um, called China and the True Jesus, which Ariel Silver mentioned. And the, the, the goal of the book is that if you read it, you will automatically know all the stuff that you needed to know about modern Chinese history. So check it out. Um, I was just wondering if you could expound on how you have sought clarity on prioritizing uh, different aspects of your life and finding balance and keeping God in that equation. Um, that's a great question because I think that's something that we all struggle with, and I really haven't figured it out. Um, but the uh, it is very clarifying to be a cancer patient um, and to just like realize you just don't care about certain things anymore. Uh, actually, I can't talk about all the things that I don't care about anymore because then probably my employers or the people that I hang out with will be offended. But, um, <laughs> but, but it, I think it just, I think it, you know, the, the, the clear thing for me when, um, when I got my diagnosis was that I just, I just wanted to spend time with my family and, um, and to focus on doing things together. And then as a working person, um, working in a lot of different fields, I think it's really important to um, to interact with the people in your profession the way that you interact with people in life. Um, as a graduate student, I was wondering, you know, how much of my research should I share with this visiting scholar? Should I, like, hold back the best quotes so that, like, you know, he didn't, like, plagiarize me or get ideas that he then used to be better than me? Um, and I asked my advisor, Henrietta Harrison at Oxford, and she just wrote back and she said, I just think we should be generous in our scholarship as we are in life. And I think that's, like, a really good rule of thumb. So we just treat everyone the way that we're supposed to be treated, no matter what the situation is, politics or professional interactions or whatever. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for this opportunity we've had to come and be edified by Sister Inouye's words, and we're so very thankful that we um, are able to attend a campus that attends not only to our academic needs, but also to our spiritual needs, and we're thankful that we're able to study the alongside all of the secular knowledge that we are attaining. Father, please know how much we love thee, and we are so very thankful again for the many, many gifts that thou hast given us, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> 